Surely my Sabbaths you shall keep, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations that you may know that I am the Lord who sanctifies you. Good morning and happy Sabbath, church. <clears throat> this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Now, I, a while back, I asked, asked for us to do this. I'm going to do it again. Uh, let's, let's take the next just one to two minutes here, very briefly, and look for someone around you. Look to your neighbor in front of you, behind you. Welcome them. Say happy Sabbath. Good to be, see, he, see you. And bonus points if you talk to someone you don't know. <clears throat> Happy Sabbath. <laughs> All right, very good, very good. And that's one of the reasons this is the friendliest church in the valley. I do want to extend a special welcome to any guests or visitors or, or newcomers to our church. Uh, we're very excited to have you with us and worshiping with us today. I do have a couple of announcements that I do want to bring to your attention. Uh, the first and foremost is I think today we have actually set a record for how many times the name McLennan has written in the bulletin. Uh, several times, I think eight. Uh, second, uh, this afternoon we're going to be going over to the North Roanoke Assisted Living and that's going to be at 1.45 this afternoon. Uh, if you have not done it, I really encourage you to do it. It's a good time uh, to support this ministry uh, so that we can be the, the hands and feet of Christ, sharing his love with those who are, are, are less fortunate. Amen. Uh, there will also be a church work bee coming up on September 29, so definitely write that into your calendars. Uh, many hands make light work. Uh, so definitely come out for that so that we can be done quickly and easily so we can get to the food that will be provided as well as games. Uh, today is the first reading for transfer of membership uh, for our pastor and his wife from the Louisville First SDA Church to the Roanoke SDA Church and also for Diane Inglesman from the Smith Mountain SDA Church to the Roanoke SDA Church. Uh, while I uh, appreciate the excitement there, there was no motion today. This is just the first reading, uh, so hold that thought, Roy. Um, and I don't know if they know this or not, but at this church, we don't write your membership down with pencil. We use permanent marker, uh, so you, they are about to be stuck with us for life. <clears throat> As we begin our worship service, uh, let's invite the Spirit of God to be with us here. Let's bow our heads. Dear Father in heaven, <clears throat> we thank you for the, for the gift of the Sabbath, a Sabbath that you have made and sanctified as a gift for us. And be with us today as we come before you to worship. Let it be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. Amen. Please join us in singing, Great is Thy Faithfulness. I don't know about you, but this song gives me reason to sing um, the faith of God. Let's just sing it with all of our hearts.
please stand with us for our opening song, Trust and Obey. The affirmation of faith today comes from Revelation chapter 14, verse 9 through 10. Let's read it together. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. You may be seated. And children, it's time for the children's story, so if you will come forward and have a seat up front. Good morning, girls and boys. How are you? Happy Sabbath. It's good to be here today, isn't it? I don't know if you were here for the last couple of Sabbaths, but we got to hear Elder Harry and Pastor Chris talk about the wonders and beauty of creation. Do you guys remember some of that? He talk, they talked about the stars and the planets and the galaxies, and they even talked about the smallest cells in our bodies and all the different parts that make up that. Well, I don't know about you, but one of the things we also learned is that as part of God's creation, one of the crowning acts of his creation was creating people, creating you and me. And, um, and I think that's pretty neat, don't you? Amen? Yeah. So 
It says in Genesis, chapter, first chapter of Genesis, verse 27, that we were created in the image of God. Pretty cool. And part of that is, is each of us are blessed with creative talents and abilities. How many of you guys like to build or create things? How many of you like art and music? Yeah, that's in part because you're created in the image of God. So, over time, humanity has often taken their inspiration from nature when they've created and built things, various things. Um, a few examples. Uh, December 17, 1903, I believe, the Wright brothers were the first to fly an airplane. And did you know that they studied birds to figure out aerodynamics and the different physics of, of flight? Um, another example would be uh, a man, by, a Swiss engineer by the name of George de Maestrel. I don't know if I'm pronouncing his last name correctly. He studied little burrs, those little things that stick to your pet's fur or to your, to your clothes when you go through the woods. He studied those under microscope and he realized that he could create something from that and he, he invented Velcro. And so many of you kids may have shoes and different things that use Velcro. He studied nature to figure that out. Uh, another example, um, different swimsuit companies like Speedo, they studied shark skin and realized that they can mimic shark skin to reduce drag on the swimsuits of professional swimmers. Okay? And then one last example that I brought with me today. Let's see if I can get it out here real quick. All right. What is this? Do you guys recognize what this device is? A, a camera. What does a camera do? Take pictures. That's exactly right. And did you know cameras are similar to something else in nature? Let me see if I can get that out. All right, what's this? Can you guys tell what this is? It's not a camera, but it's sort of like a camera. This is a model of the human eye. Pretty neat, huh? Kind of weird, but you know, it's a, that's a human eye on a big scale. All right, and the human eye is very sophisticated, but has some characteristics similar to a camera. It can take, it has a lens, much like this camera here does. This on the front part is the lens, and it focuses light on the, on the image sensor of the camera, whereas our lens focuses light on what's called the retina. And together, those images are stored on the camera. It's stored on a, a, a chip or a SD card. And for us, it's, it's stored into our brain, right? So very unique, but there are differences. The eye is far more sophisticated and, and capable than even the best cameras out there, okay? Now I know Mr. Johnny, he's here, and he works in security cameras, and Miss Jennifer's here, and they, she works in photography, but I bet you they've never used a camera or a lens as capable and sophisticated as the own eyes God has blessed you with. You can go out into a dark night and look at the stars and then look down at your hand at the lightning bug you just caught and you can, your eyes will focus instantaneously. Cameras can't quite do that as well. So God has blessed you with really amazing vision and eyes. Very, very cool. Okay. Um, that being said, is it important to protect our eyes? Yes. If we're in the construction site or in a chemistry lab, yes, we want eye protection. Um, if we're out at the beach, do we want, want to wear sunglasses sometimes? Yes, that's true, true as well. But it's also important that we protect what we watch uh, or be careful with what we watch and see. Yes? At this time, I want Addie to read us a Bible verse. Oh, she's got a child here. She's going to read us a verse from Matthew 6, verse 22 and 23. The lamb of the body is the eye. If therefore your eye is good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. So we want to be real careful with what we watch and see. We want to go out and observe things that bring honor and glory to Jesus, right? All right, amen. All right, is there a volunteer that would like to pray? I'm going to pick on my son. <laughs> Father, 
Let us pray. Dear Lord, thank you um, for this day. Thank you that we can uh, come here and, and spend this time with you here in church. Please help us to um, have a, a good Sabbath day. Um, thank you for um, the story about the eye. Please help us to always be able to um, be careful what we watch. Um, please help us to um, always be loving and always serve, serve you um, no matter what. And thank you for this uh, beautiful Sabbath day you've given us. Um, we love you so much, Lord. Amen. How many of you have gone to a restaurant and received the bill and seen that wonderful tip line that you get to fill in? Or if you're lucky uh, and there's a screen, the cashier may flip the screen around and say those ever cryptic words. It's just going to ask you a few questions as if we don't know what the question is. You may have started to have all kinds of thoughts, well, is 15% enough? 20%? It is only lunch, so maybe 18%. But they only refilled my drink once, so ah, you have to come up with that. All this math on the fly, because there's pressure there right in front of you. And then you have to figure out, okay, how do I calculate 18% of whatever my bill was? You got to pull your phone out. Far too complicated. Fortunately, God has made it quite simple for us. 10%. No hidden fees. And most importantly, no inflation, 10%. It's very simple. You move the decimal one spot, and there's your number. As deacons come forward, uh, let's remember that we are returning our tithes to God. We are not tipping him based on what we feel is adequate. Let's bow our heads. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for all the blessings that you have given to us. Please bless these funds that we are returning to you to further the spread of the gospel and to bring souls to you. Amen.
Today's scripture reading comes from Job 1, 6 through 7. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? But then Satan answered the Lord, and said, From going to and fro in earth, and from walking up and down in it. It's uh, time for our garden of prayer. And as the prayer song is sung this morning, uh, certainly if you have a particular prayer need or prayer needs, you're welcome to come forward and uh, present those to the Lord as we come together and, and pray together at this time. <clears throat> Eternal Father in heaven, how grateful we are to be in this your house this morning. Uh, you are good, you are God, and you are worthy of praise, honor, and glory. We thank you, Lord, that this is a holy place because you are here and you are holy. We recognize we're not, but we're grateful that you sent a Savior into this world. His name is Jesus to bridge the gap. Sinners, uh, coming into relation with the great and holy God once again through Christ Jesus our Lord. We're thank you, thankful, Lord, that we can come before you. As someone said, prayer is the opening of the heart to God as to a friend. And it is our privilege through the eye of faith to know that as we pray, that heaven draws near, that God, you draw near to those who are supplicating, those who are praying, those that are, who are coming and pressing into your presence. Thank you for this knowledge this morning. Thank you that we, our prayers don't bounce off this ceiling, but somehow, by some means and mechanism, they enter the very throne room of God. We don't have to book an appointment. We don't have to get through a secretary. We don't have to wait uh, for other appointments to be cleared. We can come now verily into your presence through prayer. Thank you for this honor. Thank you for inviting us. And thank you for Jesus who mediates for us and that we can come into to your presence through his name. Lord, you've been good to us this week through the ups and through the downs. Uh, things have changed, but you have not. You are God. You are the same yesterday, today, and forever. Uh, you've seen us through the highs and through the lows, uh, through those moments of concern and stress, through those moments of joy and, and, uh, and release. You've been good and faithful. And we give you praise this morning for that. Also, Lord, we've seen you working in our lives and those lives we've been praying for and, and working in means and ways in which we don't understand or don't see. We thank you for that as well. And this morning, Lord, we know we can bring to you our prayer needs, those things that burden our hearts, those things that we're concerned about, those things that, um, that uh, we need you and only you can do something about. There are those who've come forward because they have special needs this morning, special requests, and they're bringing them to you. And Lord, I, we lift them all before your throne of grace and mercy, knowing that we have this confidence that if we ask anything according to your will, you hear us. And if we know that you hear us whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of you. We have this confidence today, Lord, because you are good, you're a prayer answering God, and we know that you will do what is right and best in each life. Lord, in, in particular this morning, I just want to uplift those 
in our midst who have been and are still grieving loss. I want to uplift to you, Lord, those who are not well, those who may be struggling financially. There may be some in our congregation this morning that are on the uh, just struggling spiritually, praying for them this morning too. Praying for our young people, our youth, our young adults, that Lord, you will hedge them in, that you'll protect them, that you will bless them, keep them, and use them in your service. And for those who can't be with us because they are shut in, so to speak, we pray for them this morning as well. May the blessing that attends us here be just as much theirs there. Lord, we thank you again for loving us. Again, we thank you for Jesus, the Savior of our souls. And we pray all of these things this morning in his precious and in his holy name. Amen. saints good to see you this morning and a happy sabbath to each one of you it's good to see you you're not looking too worse for wear obviously god has been good to you and uh, he still remains faithful doesn't he what a privilege to gather together we are so blessed to be here uh, studying and worshiping and praising and singing and praying Um, what a wonderful time to gather together no place no better place to be on Sabbath morning than the Roanoke Seventh-day Adventist Church. Yeah, well, I thought I would get a few more amens than that this morning, but uh, there's no better place to be. And we are grateful to be here. And we're so grateful too to the many individuals who behind the scenes are working so hard to make sure that this service is uh, not filled with distractions, but elevating and lifting our eyes and minds to God, our musicians and those working the AV and um, our uh, greeters and, and, de- and elders and deacons and everyone else who's pitching in. Do you get the, do you get the Friday update in your e- email, in your email inbox? If you don't get that, you need to get it. And uh, I'm not sure exactly how to make that happen, but you do. Um, we have a great communications secretary who makes sure we are uh, updated on things in the church. Thank you to everyone for all that you do to make church church and to be a blessing to, to each one that comes through these doors. This morning, I want to continue some thoughts uh, that we've been discussing and... I'm, I'm going to see if we, oh, okay, I'm looking at the wrong, the wrong screen as I typically do. Why isn't it moving up there? I want to continue some thoughts this morning that we've, been continue, that we've been discussing the last couple of weeks, and this is going to continue for a few more weeks into the future once we get past communion and the like. But this morning, I want to talk to you about earth wars, earth wars. Now, this is our earth, our beautiful home, of course, perfectly placed in the cosmos to allow life to thrive. And currently, it houses nearly 8 billion inhabitants, 8 billion people. Now, if you just take a little step backwards, you'll see that this is our solar system. And Earth is that tiny spot there in our great solar system. It's, uh, our solar system, of course, is the, the, the home of our life-giving sun and all our planetary neighbors. Earth makes up... 0.0003% of the total mass of our solar system. When we zoom out a little further, you'll notice that this is our solar, what they call the solar interstellar system. It spans about 300 light years across 
and it contains several thousand stars. These are our, uh, these are our neighbors, so to speak, solar systems. And then you have our home, the ga home galaxy, the Milky Way. It's about 100,000 light years across and 1,000 light years deep. And it contains billions of stars. If the center of the Milky Way was a city, then we would be living, planet Earth, would, we would be living in suburbia, about 25,000 to 30,000 light years from the city center. That's quite a track just to get to the center of the city. Pulling out further, you'll notice this is what we call our local galactic group. It's dominated by the Andromeda and the Milky Way galaxies, but all in all, it houses about 70 galaxies. Now, this is what they call a supercluster. This is the Virgo supercluster. This is the Virgo supercluster, and this is the cluster that Earth finds itself in. It has a diameter of 110 million, they say, light years. Within it are found around 100 galaxy groups and clusters. The Virgo supercluster is about 7,000 times the size of our local galactic group and 100 billion times the size of our Milky Way galaxy. Then this is the local supercluster in which the Virgo supercluster is found. Each supercluster contains their own gal galactic groups and each galactic group, of course, contains its own galaxies and so on. And then finally, our local supercluster is nestled in a massive universe comprising about 10 million other superclusters. Consider that the universe, they say, is some 93 billion light years across. A single light year, of course, is 5. Point, of course, 5.8 trillion miles. So therefore, the universe is 93 billion times 5.8 trillion miles around, across. And Earth is merely 7,000 900 miles in diameter. So you would find it very difficult to see our puny planet from the nearest star, and it would be absolutely impossible to locate us from the nearest galaxy. Someone suggested that if the Empire State Building was our universe, then our galaxy is like a little crumb on one of its many ledges. When thinking about how small we really are, it's easy to consider ourselves seemingly insignificant. We've talked a little bit about that. If we're that small, then our, it carries the question, do our lives carry any, any significance at all? Is there any purpose to yours and my existence? Do our individual decisions actually have any weight in the grand scheme of things if we're that small, if we're that puny? The Bible reveals, and we've been talking about this, that the earth has taken center stage to the universe. Our world with the, the teeming inhabitants, other worlds and their teeming inhabitants and angels that, that are living in glory, are focused on what is playing out here on planet earth. So earth, no matter how small we are, has become consequential in the grand scheme of things. The cosmic battle involving this whole world, as we've been looking at, is spearheaded by that once shining angel in glory, Lucifer, seeking on earth what he failed to get in heaven. Lucifer, now of course Satan, was ultimately evicted from heaven when he sought to take God's throne, wanting the prerogatives of Michael the archangel or Christ, the Son of God, the creator of the world, and not being able to have those prerogatives, he defected from the government of heaven and led a third of, his, of the angels in heaven into war up there. Not being able to get what he wanted in heaven, he came here to planet Earth. And the conflict comes to a head in the book of Revelation, chapter 13, verses 3 and 4, where it says, And all the world marveled and followed the beast. And so they worshipped the, what friends? 
The dragon, and if you read in the context, the dragon is referring to the devil and Satan himself, the serpent, that great serpent of old. They worshipped the dragon by following the beast who gave authority to the beast, and they worshipped the beast. Everything comes down to a head in these last days. Satan is determined to get what he couldn't get in heaven, and that, that is worship. To take the glory he could not get up there. So when Satan came to this tiny or this pale blue dot, this tiny blue dot, what did he do? Well, he quickly went to Adam and Eve and he got them on his side. And we could say that the whole world wandered after the beast. Now, there, are only, there were only two people, but they followed after the dragon, Satan himself. And that's what happened back then. He said to them, has God said this? Why don't you go ahead and do this? And they were just beguiled enough to go right ahead and do it. And so when he got to earth, Lucifer, Satan, he quickly established himself as the ruler of this world. And he has claimed rulership and has wreaked havoc ever since his very inception. So the question would be, would the inhabitants of this world be locked in this battle indefinitely without help or without aid? How could anyone hope to overcome defeat and ultimate destruction at the hand of this very powerful spiritual being? Would there be anyone out there who knows and who cares? Would there be anyone out there who could provide help and assistance to this lonely little planet? Contrary to the grim outlook of one of America's popular astronomers who once bemoaned our lot when he said, quote, in our obscurity, in all our, this vastness, there is no hint that help will come from elsewhere to save us from ourselves. Despite having said that, humanity has not been left to itself to meet its own demise and its own dis destruction. On this moat of dust, Suspended in a sunbeam, in this vast universe, we are not alone. There is help indeed for you and for me. So to our first parents was given in the form of a prophecy, the hope of a mighty helper. And if you have your Bible, I'd like to invite you to turn with me to Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. To our first parents came these words of encouragement and hope. And it says, and I, God is speaking here to the serpent who is the devil and Satan. And he says, and I will put enmity or hatred between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. Now, speaking of that seed of the woman, he goes on to say, and he, the seed, will bruise your head, serpent, Satan, and you shall bruise his heel. Pay very close attention to those words. The Bible says that a savior would come ultimately to set things right. He would come and really he would initiate a counter force to help those that are caught in this all out war. There was hope and the Bible says there was help. Help was on its way and eventually that prophecy was met in none other than Jesus of Nazareth. You can imagine if you step back with me just to the time of Christ as he's left the carpenter's bench, you can imagine what Christ's enemy must have thought when he noticed and he saw and he heard the thundering words of the forerunner of the Son of God paving the way for the entrance, proclaiming a stirring message to the people about the coming Messiah. Was it time for the Christ to come? Would Satan's priorities and would Satan's plans ultimately be thwarted by the promised one? When Satan appeared, and, we, and Nathaniel did a nice job reading that in the scripture this morning, when, when Satan appeared in that galactic council where the Lord met with the representatives of other uh, inhabitants or the leaders of the other worlds, he proclaimed, Satan proclaimed to be ruler of this world. When he, asked, when he was asked, where are you coming from, Satan? He said, I'm coming from walking up and down on the earth. That's another way of saying, I'm master of that tiny pale blue dot. That world is mine, and the reason that world is mine is because the people are mine. That's what he claimed. But now, 
what he dreaded more than anything was close at hand. His power was soon to be taken out of his hand by another more powerful being, and that being would be, as we discussed last week, the master of the universe, Jesus Christ. So the Bible says that Jesus was commissioned for service at his baptism, and he was done so at the hand of his forerunner. It was there that his father confirmed his relationship with him. He called him his son. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. There was the confirmation right there. No guessing now as to who the son of God was, who who the seed of the woman was now, the one who would, would come to disrupt Satan's plans, the mighty and the mighty influence of the enemy. And so in Matthew chapter four and verse one, we have these interesting words and I want to read them to you and you're welcome to come over there with me. In Matthew chapter 4 and verse 1. Matthew chapter 4 and verse 1. It says about Jesus. Then Jesus was led up. And this is after his his, uh, initiation into commissioning into service and his baptism. that, That Jesus was led up by the Holy Spirit or by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. That's very interesting. Why would Jesus go into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil? We just read that the Holy Spirit led him into the wilderness to be tempted. Now, just keep in mind that this meeting would be the first time in about 4,000 years that Christ or Michael and Satan, Lucifer, had met. Over 4,000 years. The last time, Satan was cast out of heaven. And Jesus Christ was victorious. Now they meet again, but this time, things are very, very different. Things are different. How different? Well, the Son of God is no longer surrounded by adoring angels in the pure, undefiled precincts of heaven. Christ is no longer, no longer has power and authority as that has been purposefully laid aside. He no longer is clothed in majesty and glory and splendor. Instead, he is clothed in the humble fare of humanity. He has become one like us. He has left all of that behind and entered this puny planet in this vast universe to meet Satan on his own turf, to come and do battle as man, not as God. Now, it already appears as though Christ is at a huge disadvantage, doesn't it? How could any man withstand the onslaughts of the enemy? Hasn't mankind already succumbed many times over? Hasn't mankind bowed the knee to Satan repeatedly time and time again? How could Christ, clothed in humanity, pry the reigning scepter out of Satan's hand and then clasp it with his own? Additionally, Satan is on his own ground. It's familiar territory to him. He's been here for thousands of years. He knows the weaknesses of frail humanity. He knows which buttons to push. And it appears as though Christ, he has an advantage over Christ. And the Bible, on top of that, tells us that Satan often appears as an angel. Not easy to spot, not easy to know. In fact, the Bible says, and no wonder Satan himself transforms himself into a what, friends? An angel of light. And so Satan doesn't hand out business cards announcing, hey, I'm the devil, I'm about to deceive you. That's just not what the devil does. Uh, he's, he's, he's crafty, he's cunning, he's sneaky, he's subtle, he's hard to identify. And so it's a fair question to ask, why would the Holy Spirit lead Christ into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil? Why? Why? It appears to be a trap, a battle that's already going to be lost. What we do know about this meeting is that it has to be consequential. It has to be. It has to be significant. This is Christ. And this is Satan locked in battle. I mean, this is monumental. We know that the masters of the universe have been in a contest for millennia 
over who is worthy to rule and receive the worship of all created intelligences. Satan says God is not who he claims to be. Satan says he is deserving to be ruler over all. So this meeting in the wilderness has got to be consequential to you and to me. I want you to notice the nature of the battle. Go with me to verses 2 and 3 in Matthew chapter 4. It says, And when he had fasted, that is Christ, 40 days and 40 nights, afterward he was hungry. Verse 3, Now when the tempter came to him, he said, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. Now jump down to verse 5. Then the devil took him up into the holy city, set him on the pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down. Now jump over to verse uh, verse 9. Verse 8. Thank you. And again, the devil took him up onto an exceeding high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. The audacity of Satan to claim rulership of this world, then offer it to the creator of it all and then ask him to bow down to Satan if he would give him everything. A created being asking the creator to acknowledge the supremacy of the created. You'd say, what boldness? You'd say, what brashness? What nerve? But you see it here. What Satan wanted in heaven, he came here to planet earth to seek. He is seeking worship that only the creator himself is worthy to receive. So what's the significance of these temptations, friends? What's the significance of them? In fact, you may have looked at these temptations before and you may have asked yourself what any of these temptations have to do with you. On the surface, you might say, how does this affect me and my salvation? How does this help me really and truly? I mean, if it's true that the Bible says that Christ was tempted in all points, like as we are, but you may find that very, very hard to see in these verses. Have you ever been tempted to turn stones to bread? I mean, I, I haven't. I suppose you haven't either because you know why? Because none of us can turn stone to bread. Have you ever been tempted to jump off a pinnacle expecting God to catch you? Most of us would be up there holding on for dear life. Have you ever been, has the devil ever come to you and tempted you and said, here, I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world? He never come to me with that proposition. And I suspect he hasn't come to you with that proposition either. So you wouldn't be faulted for asking how these temptations are consequential to our lives. How they help us in this great cosmic struggle. How they help us with the sin problem. Your sin, our sin. I want to submit to you here this morning that this conflict in the wilderness between Christ and Satan is the foundation of the plan of salvation. And you're going to say, what? Where did that come from? That just came out of the blue. I'm going to show you where I got that from in just a few minutes, but you're going to see it as we unravel this. If it is the foundation of the plan of salvation, then if, if it is, then what is happening here in this struggle is incredibly important for you and me, which we're going to see. Remember, one of the false claims of Satan uh, against God was that God's forgiveness nullifies his law. That the law is of no consequence. The constitution of heaven, the foundation of the throne of government is obsolete. It doesn't matter. His claim is that it's not important, it's not necessary, that it doesn't need to be kept or obeyed by anybody except accepted by God. Nobody needs to worry about it. And on top of that, a corollary to that, he has claimed that if you think you need to obey it, it's impossible for you to do so. That's his claim. And of course, that's an attack on God and his character and who he is. What we're going to see here is that Christ answers this, char this false charge and not just declared that it should be and could be obeyed, but that he, in human garb, would demonstrate that it could be. He would demonstrate that. And in doing so, he would lay to rest the claims, the false claims, 
that God is exacting. And this demonstration that we're about to see would settle the notion that sin, which is disobedience to God's holy law, the constitution of heaven, that sin doesn't have to have control of you. It doesn't have to rule in your life. So let's understand this. Let's take a step back and see if we can understand this. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 4, verses 15 and 16, we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses. Or in another way, if you cancel out the negatives, we have a high priest who sympathizes with our weaknesses. But was in all points tempted, like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Question for you here. What seems to be the point of these verses? What's the the point of, of what Paul is saying here? Aren't these verses telling us that we can come boldly to the throne of grace to find help from Jesus, the one who understands our struggle? Is that what it isn't that what it's saying? That's surely what it's saying. He's been tempted just as we are. Yet on the surface, you look at those three temptations in the wilderness and you ask yourself, well, how do these affect me? How I've never been tempted in these areas. The Bible avoids us, uh, counsels us to avoid all temptation. But in Matthew, as far as possible, but as Matthew chapter 4 verse 1, it tells us that the Holy Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness. It seems so contradictory. And on top of that, wouldn't Jesus be tempted enough with all the harassment and all the opposition and all the false accusations that he would go through, not to mention what he would have to endure through Gethsemane all the way to Calvary? What's so significant about these temptations in the wilderness? How do they provide aid and assistance in my struggle, in your struggle against Satan? How do they impact your life and my life? Now, we do see a connection with Christ's first temptation and Adam and Eve's, the first sin in the Garden of Eden, because they had fallen to the sin of appetite. And Jesus overcame appetite. That was the first temptation in the wilderness. He overcame that in the wilderness. So we have some vague understanding that Jesus was taking back some ground that was lost. That somehow he is reversing what Adam and Eve had done. And that somehow this is going to help us in this cosmic battle between good and evil. To aid us in the battle with sin with regard to disobedience to God's holy law. So how does Jesus' victory, and we'll focus on this one today. How does Jesus' victory over appetite help you and help me? How was Jesus tempted like we are, turning rocks to bread? Now, these are very serious questions with very serious implications. And if the conflict in the wilderness is at the foundation of the plan of salvation, we need to, no, we must understand this. We have to understand this. So we know that in this cosmic struggle between good and evil, how many sides are there? Good and evil, there are two. If you go back to the Garden of Eden, of course, there are how many trees? Essentially two, the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. There are two trees. In other words, there are two choices. There are two destinies. In the Garden of Eden, there were two schools of thought, two sides, if you please. So under the tree of life, you have the following. Believe in God. Trust in his word, his law, and, uh, and, and obey, of course. And then you will have or you will, you will live forever. That's at the core of the school of thought that is under the tree of life. But there was another tree. The other school of thought was very different. The thinking under this, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, was learn to listen to doubts, skepticism. Trust in your own reasonings, your own senses, your own feelings... And then what would be the result? Eternal death. That's right. And you know, and I know, that every school of thought that has ever been in the world throughout the history of the world is presented right here in the Garden of Eden. Two schools. One of either will fit into these categories. 
It either teaches total trust in God or it teaches total trust in others or yourself. Those are the only schools, school of thoughts that are out there. Notice what the Bible says in Proverbs. This is the tree of life school of thought. Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with how much of your heart? All your heart. Lean not unto your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. That's the thinking under the tree of life. But then over in Proverbs chapter 14, verse 12, you have the thinking under the tree of knowledge of good and evil where it says there is a way that seems right to a man but the end thereof is the way of what friends death it may seem right but it leads to death so when when eve was was at the forbidden tree and i want you to go back with me to genesis 3 for a moment when eve was at that forbidden tree didn't she end up doing what seemed right to her look at verse 6 in genesis 3 verse 6 so when the woman saw the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes. I appreciated the children's story this morning, Mr. Robert. Be careful, little eyes, what you see. That it was desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave it to her husband with her, And he ate. Now, we don't even know if she was hungry when she took that fruit. As she looked at the fruit, it appeared, appealed rather to her senses. It created a desire for its power. What do I mean? Well, if the snake that was talking to her ate the fruit and then began to talk, what other wonderful benefits could it hold out to her? The snake said it would make her as wise as God. And there was obviously evidence of this right before her. So to Eve, everything seemed good, but God had said something. It seemed okay, it seemed reasonable, but God had said. And what did Eve end up doing, if we were to put it in today's vernacular, as Hollywood likes to say? She followed her heart. She followed her heart. You see, there are only two schools of thought. There are two trees, there are two choices, there are two destinies. Humanity has been choosing what seems right, what feels right, what appears right over what God has said ever since this little battle in the Garden of Eden. Since the Garden, human reasoning, human judgment, human passions, human desires, human opinion have continually been above what God has said, trusting to self. You see, it was a lot more than a piece of fruit in the Garden of Eden. For us, there are still two trees. There are still two choices. There are still two destinies. Which school of thought have you adopted? Which school are you learning in? Because you are learning in one school or another. Now, let me just make something clear here because the issue isn't feelings versus reasoning. The issue is not feelings versus versus, uh, trusting and reason. That's not the issue at all. The issue is trusting feelings and reason, both over trusting God's word. I'm going to say that again. The issue is trusting feelings and reason above trusting God's word. And this has been one of the biggest problems in human history. If you go back in scripture, you think about some Bible characters. I go to the story of Jacob and Esau. Esau was starving. He came in, felt like he was dying. He said to Jacob, give me your birthright. And he reasoned, he reasoned that if he died of starvation, the birthright was going to be lost anyway. So he sold his birthright for a bowl of soup or stew. Now, Did he make his choice by feelings or by reason? Both. Both, didn't he? Most would agree that his feelings were the most dominant, obviously. I mean, he wasn't close to dying, but he just felt like he was. But he saw. He followed his heart. He did that which was right to man, seemed right to man. Now, what about Jacob? (laughs) Did Jacob do wrong? Did Jacob trust God? He asked for the birthright, right? He sought to steal it. Did Jacob make his choice by feeling or by reason? His reasoning for sure. No question, he was very calculated. 
But weren't his feelings very much involved too? Jacob followed his heart and he did what seemed right. Now Joseph, he stands out in human history because when Potiphar's wife continually communicated with, with him about her own desires for him, what did Joseph do? He fully trusted God's word and he didn't pay, put any confidence into his own feelings or his own desires. He didn't put any confidence in his own reasoning. He just did what God told him to do. Moses, all through the Israel's wanderings, they're whining and they're complaining. Moses continually trusted God, except for one time. Moses yielded to his feelings and impatiently and passionately, what did he do? When God said, speak to the rock, he, he struck that rock. He went from his gut impulse and it was incredibly costly to himself. Now, the poster boy for trusting in one's own feelings in the Old Testament would be Samson, wouldn't it? Love and passion made the strongest man in the world into the weakest man that ever lived. We could talk about Eli indulging his children. We could talk about David and how uh, most of his life he trusted in God. And then he followed that wrong impulse, which resulted in that whole uh, Beth, uh, uh, Bathsheba debacle. We could come up with many more examples because not just people in the scriptures, but just about every single person in this room, in the world, has at one time or another trusted their own reasoning, their own feelings, which has gotten them into trouble. You still have the battle, I still have the battle, and it's a battle in our lives and it's going to be that way until Jesus comes. Now, there are some people in the Bible. We talked about Joseph. There's Elisha. There's Daniel as well, who we don't have a record where anything like this is mentioned. But there are some, but mostly, most people, when you read the stories of the Bible, there's idolatry and there's immorality and there's rebellion against the word of God because they mostly chose to yield to their appetites and to their passions, to follow the, what Paul would call the lusts of the flesh. Ele elevate their own reasoning, their own feelings above and their desires above the word of God. And I want you to notice this is really interesting because their feelings and their desires corrupted their reasoning. And then with that corrupted reasoning, they defended their sinful lifestyle and practices. You see how this works? That's why it says of Lucifer, his uh, the shining angel in glory, he was corrupted by his own reasoning. He was corrupted by his own reasoning. And that's how it works. He was, we are locked in a battle with self. Now, later on in the Bible, it appears as though God's people have learned their lesson. They're resisting idolatry. There appears to be very little immorality going on. However, what is, uh, what's happened here? is that they've learned to trust in their own reasoning in a different kind of way, which led to a kind of self-righteousness. It became the new, new norm. They were trusting in, in self, man's opinions, man's reasonings over the word of God, and yet what they were doing is they were professing, while they were doing that, they were professing to uphold the word of God. Before, God's word had been set aside for appetites and passions, but not anymore. This was something very new, something worse, because how do, you, how do you reach a person who believes they are following the Bible, but it is self who is still the driving force between all of their choices and all of their decisions? How do you do that? So whether it's the, it's the evil of open sin and worldliness, or whether it's the evil of self-righteousness, it is all still like Eve at the tree, trusting to self, adopting the wrong school of thought, taking the wrong side. And you know, the difference between legalism and self-righteousness and worldliness and self-indulgence is not as big as we actually think. The bottom line is in both cases, both are trusting in self. Both are looking to and trusting in self. One is not more righteous than the other. Now for you and for me, which school of thought have we adopted? 
Which school are we being trained under? For us, there are still two trees. There are still two choices. There are still two schools of thought. And there are still two destinies. What kind of choices might we be dealing with today? So I want to bring it down to kind of a more personal level here this morning. Appetite. Let's talk about appetite because that's where it kind of all begins, right? Uh, Appetite's the most obvious thing that we've been talking about. This was Jesus' first temptation to turn stones into bread. That has to do with appetite, right? So we've got to eat to live. That's the truth. You can't avoid it. So maybe it's, is, maybe it's something we know we shouldn't be eating. Oh, but man, it smells so good. Oh, but man, it tastes, it looks so good. And man, it tastes great. It tastes so good. We've still got two trees, right? We've still got two trees. Will it be faith or will it be feelings? Will it be faith or will it be feelings? The taste are the feelings, right? They certainly are. Well, what about uh, when we know perhaps we've eaten just enough? But man, that stuff over there still looks real good and it's inviting me. Still tempting me, still beckoning me, still calling me. Well, there's still two destinies, right? What would those destinies be? Fitness or fatness, right? Isn't that how it works? No, there's just two laws at work. It's interesting, in Proverbs 23, we have the wisdom from Solomon, and he says this, he says, Put a knife to your throat if you be a man given to appetite. Wow. Sometimes following your heart just simply means following your belly. That's all it means. What about alcohol? What about drinking alcohol? Now, there are Christians who say a little bit doesn't hurt you. There may even be some here that have that opinion today. I don't know. God forbid. You know, there are two choices here, right? According to Proverbs chapter 20, there are consequences. The Bible says, wine is a mocker, strong drink is raging, and whoever partakes of it is not wise. In other words, you're dumb. You're dumb. You're a fool if you partake in alcoholic beverages. So there are still still two trees, still two choices, and what are they? It's going to be freedom or it's going to be bondage. Because just moderate drinking will enslave three out of five people who, ins- who, who moderately drink. What about human sexuality? Are there two schools of thought here? <coughs> Excuse me. Will we go by what God says or will we go by what we feel, what we desire? Now, no doubt, unfaithfulness in marriage, youthful immorality, self-abuse, viewing pornography are all choices to yield to the feelings and the desires and the passions rather than living by it is written, what the word of God says. I think you would agree with me there. 1 Corinthians 6 verse 18 says, like Joseph, flee sexual immorality. And the seventh commandment calls for faithfulness in and to one's spouse. The Bible is very clear, but trusting feelings, trusting your heart ends up destroying people, ends up destroying relationships, often hurts family, kills the kids, if not destroys them. And so that's human sexuality. What about media? What about media? Are there two schools of thought here? Are you tempted to watch immorality and violence? Will it be the Bible or will it be Babylon? There's just confusion over there. Psalm 101 verse 3 says, I will set no wicked thing before mine eye. I will set no wicked thing before my eye. I hate the work of them that turn aside. It shall not cleave to me. You know, the phrase follow your heart really is usually in Hollywood. And it means go with your instinct, go with your feelings, go with your gut instincts. Did you know that that is the key teaching in just about every animated Disney movie? Follow your heart. The key point of the movie always has to do with a person, person trusting their instincts, following their own gut instincts, and, uh, and, and recognizing some power that is within. And you know it's a lie, and our kids are being brainwashed by it. And then the phrase is often used and referenced in romance movies. The key point is where they trust their own heart, and if they do, the right guy shows up. That's probably got to be the dumbest way to deal with uh, human relationships when it comes to the opposite sex. But that's what they constantly teach. Trust your heart and the right guy, the right gal, they'll just show up, they'll just appear. What about music? 
What about music? You know, it's amazing how much music teaches you just to do as you please. That's the idea behind a lot of music. There isn't any difference between that and follow your heart or live by your own desires or trust yourself because you know what's best for you. Thankfully, we have a choice to listen to and sing wholesome and uplifting music based on Bible truth and the goodness of God, the one whose word we can trust and the word, one whose word we can live by. So again, there are two choices. There's two schools of thought. It's either the Bible or it's Babylon. Are we going to go by what is, it is written or are we going to sit under the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? There's a choice. Now, if you're a hiker and you like to take some walks here in these mountains and hills, this is one thing you do not want to stumble across, right? You don't want to come across one of these. It's frightening to come down this trail and find this rattlesnake coiled up, looking like it's ready to strike. And he's lightning quick and incredibly accurate. Well, a friend of mine offered a simple two-point program for handling rattlesnakes, and I'm going to put, them up, put it up on the screen here for you. It's simply these two things, shun and avoid. Shun and avoid. It's that simple. You don't need much insight to figure out what to do with something as dangerous as a rattlesnake. You're not going to go play with it. You're not going to toy with it. You're not going to touch it, get near it. You're going to shun and avoid. You just don't mess around with it. And you know, you know that there's a lot of things as dangerous or more dangerous than a rattlesnake out there, isn't there? Surely. Shun and avoid is the most sensible way to deal with these things. Now, throughout human history, including today in our time, the devil has been successful in getting men and women and children to trust in self and to follow their natural inclinations and their natural passions. And it's how sin entered humanity in the Garden of Eden. And frankly, it is what Jesus dealt with in the first temptation in the wilderness. We must understand it better. We must understand what this temptation, these temptations are about if we're going to be victorious in these last days. Are you with me? Are you tracking with me this morning? Well, this afternoon? So by appetites and passions, we mean anything that we naturally desire. It could be a craving. It's those natural things. And if it weren't for sin, if it weren't for our sinful natures, it wouldn't be a problem because then all our desires would be good desires. But sinful man naturally has sinful inclinations and appetites and passions, and these have controlled mankind from the very beginning. When our feelings rule, God's holy law, the law of love, the Ten Commandments, the Constitution of Heaven, usually gets trampled on, doesn't it? Usually gets trampled on. And it's just the way Satan wants it. When appetites and passions rule, what are the results? I might live an unhealthy lifestyle, then what ends up happening? I end up with a disease. Or I might eat too much and I continue to eat too much. And what do they say about the, greater the, the more the snacks, the, greater the, the bigger the slacks or something like that? And what I'm doing, friends, is I'm breaking the sixth commandment that says thou shalt not kill. I'm just giving myself a slow death with my knife and with my fork. When the appetites and passions rule... The result might be a loss of temper. When there's loss of temper, what it normally happens is harsh words that are spoken, cutting words, and people get hurt. And if it's angry enough, it could lead to profanity. And if it's angry enough, it could lead to violence. And if it's angry enough, it could end up leading to someone's death, being hurt or death. When appetites and passion control, the result is lust. And that leads to viewing things that ought not be looked at. Or sexual relations before marriage. Or adultery that leads to broken families. Or if it's perverted, it'll lead to disease. When appetites and passions control, the results are covetousness. That leads people to being very discontented and unhappy. Which leads to stealing. And stealing, when it gets more uh, sophisticated, results sometimes in violence and in death. When appetites and passions control us, the result could be smoking and alcohol or drugs, which leads to a clouded mind, damaged brain, a mental disorder, homelessness, a crime, and even, yes, murder. So how, how well does God's law fare 
when appetites and passions control us. Doesn't fare very well, does it? The natural consequences of these choices are actions that bring misery and suffering and in some cases death. Mankind, you and I, have mainly chosen the wrong tree to eat from. The wrong school of thought. We've adopted the wrong school of thought. And, our, and the destiny for mankind is eternal death. You see, left to ourselves, we're a mess. We're lost. We're without hope. But praise be to God that he hasn't left us to ourselves. He has intervened. And when you and I talk about God intervening to save man, what's the first thing that normally comes to mind? You think of the great love of God demonstrated on Calvary's cross. Isn't that the first thing that comes to your mind? And it should be. Praise God for that, rightly so. Jesus paid the penalty for our sin, breaking God's holy law so that we might be forgiven, that we might be restored into a right relationship with him. God's love is purely, simply amazing. No question. God intervened, though, in another, in another way, an intervention that isn't well understood, if understood at all. It was in the desert wilderness. And it was why the Holy Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. There's something really at stake here that hasn't really been understood. You see, if it's possible, it's possible to know and appreciate the love of God as, re as revealed in Calvary's cross. You can love God. You can have an appreciation for what Jesus did for you. It may even bring a tear to your eye, and that would be fine. You can have an appreciation for the love of God and yet still remain under the control of your appetites and your passions and you don't know how to break free. The promise of the mighty helper given in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15 tells us that he would come. And what would he do when he would come? The Bible says that he would crush the serpent's head or Satan's head under his foot. Now, friends, that's a fatal blow. There's no recovery from that. There's no coming back from that. We can take hope and encouragement in a promise like that. Can you say amen? There's no question. To do that, Jesus would set in operation a counterforce to undo all that Satan had done. He would help us live, essentially, live under the tree of life, offering us a way of living in obedience to Jesus Christ, not following our appetites and passions, but following instead and trusting in the word of God. And how would he do it? Calvary? Yes, for sure. But before Calvary, Jesus went into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil to overcome as a man, a human being. He came to rescue us from the fall and where mankind has been falling ever since. Jesus overcame temptation on appetite and passion, showing you and me how the power of Satan can be broken in our lives. Amen. God has intervened in the desert wilderness. God has stepped in, and Jesus took the battle on the ground of the devil, and he took it there for you and for me. Now, in this fascinating book, the book Confrontation, it uh, goes into more depth than the book Desire of Ages. But you read this on page 63. The scene of trial with Christ in the wilderness was the foundation of the plan of salvation and gives to fallen man the key whereby he or she, in Christ's name, may overcome. So in the wilderness, we see, there the, we see there the foundation of the plan of salvation. In the temptations of Christ, there is a key. If we would adopt the key in the name of Christ, we would overcome sin and temptation. And so today, the big question is, can we understand how Christ, facing those three temptations in the wilderness, are the foundation to the plan of salvation? If your view of salvation is limited, you're going to have a hard time understanding this. But I'm going to appeal to you over the next few weeks to, to ask the Holy Spirit to expand your mind, to broaden your concepts of salvation, to see all that heaven really wants to do in your life and in mine. While we don't get tempted to turn stones to bread, 
we do see that this temptation of Jesus was rooted in our, and related to our natural pull toward carnal, central appetites rather, and central passions. That is trusting what self wants, whether it comes by feeling or desire, by reason or by logic. It's all about natural inclinations to care for oneself, to take care of me, myself and I, my desires, my wants, my feelings so that I could perceivably feel good. If Jesus turned those stones into bread, would he have been focusing on his own needs, his own wants, his own desires to feel good, to care for himself? He would have, right? So was he in fact tempted like as we are? We're going to discover in the upcoming weeks that Jesus' victory can be ours. And today, before we even get there, you can claim that victory as your own. I am so thankful for the hope of victory that is found in God's word. Will you please stand with us and join us in singing Yield Not to Temptation. encouraging promise when we look at Jesus in the wilderness of temptation where he gained victory he did it for you and he did it for me and we can claim it as our own today can you say amen let's pray together father in heaven we thank you that in the wilderness we see the foundation of the plan of salvation you're going to stretch our minds here over the next few weeks you're going to speak to our hearts you're going to dig a little deeper into our lives and we're going to give you permission to go places that we have not allowed you to go places yet. And so, Lord, please lead us on, guide us. We look to Jesus to aid us, to comfort, to strengthen and keep us. For he and he alone will carry us through. We praise you and we thank you for this Jesus, the mighty deliverer, the one who, who uh, bruised the serpent's head. 
We take confidence and courage in him today. And we pray these things and give you thanks. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat>